I'd like to welcome all visitors with us this morning. We are grateful to have you. Anyone home for the holidays? Um, just glad to have you back into the family. I uh, wanted a quick announcement that this morning, one of our elders, uh, Brendan McMillan, uh, he is being um, uh, brought on as a senior pastor uh, at a church in Elizabeth. I think it's Elizabeth Bible Church. I might get the name wrong, but hallelujah, we have a, a sister church um, in Elizabeth with him now being the preaching pastor there. And so we are just full of joy with what all God has done to bring that about. So to, to him be the glory. Um, and may God be with Brendan and his family as they reach, uh, preach and serve this body there. This morning, we're going to take up the subject of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, his uh, entrance into the world that he created. And he came into this world, as we heard, to accomplish salvation. So what I want to do this morning is direct our thoughts to this truth, to, to just fill our hearts, that the fruit of our time together would be, as we sang, oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. And so where I um, have felt led this morning is I want to focus on one aspect of the incarnation. There are so many beams that come out of this life. And God has been working in my own heart just on the deep, deep mercy of God. And so it's taken up my thoughts and it's filled me with such joy, the tender mercies of our God. And so we're going to do a topical study just on the mercies of God, things that we've been looking at for the last five years, just going to bring them all together in one sermon and stare at the mercy of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's go to him in prayer. Father, we come before you, and it is a mercy that sinners can now come before you because of the work of Jesus Christ. God, to have sins washed away and that veil torn in two, we come with boldness and great joy, and I just thank you this morning for the way that you brought it about was the bringing in of your Son into this world who would bring about our salvation. And so, God, as we now look at this diamond called Jesus Christ, from every angle and every facet of his great mercy, I pray, bless hearts, heal hurting people. God, anyone in here who does not know Jesus Christ, let him see him or her see the mercy of God in Christ this morning. Let the saints be made glad with such a great salvation. God, meet us here now, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to give you your outline as we begin this morning. We're going to consider God's mercy in six ways. Um, six ways. The first one is we're going to see the preparation of mercy, the promise of mercy, the plan to reveal our deep need of this mercy, the procurement of God's mercy, the plea of mercy, and then we'll close with the pattern of mercy. And, and Daniel introduced it perfectly for us. So let's Let's come together. The first point, I want you to see the preparation of mercy. If you'll turn to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> As we go to Genesis chapter 3, context is pretty beautiful. You don't, I don't have to set it very long. It's only two chapters. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we just watched this poetical description of God creating the universe, bringing it into being. It's good, it's good, it's good. He makes Adam and Eve. It's very good. Uh, there's just this peace. There's shalom. Everything is right. Everything's in order because God's at the center and everything is worshiping and looking to our great God. And so all, all is working the way it was supposed to. Uh, a mutual love relationship between God and man. And now if you'll come with me to Genesis 3.1. The serpent who was more crafty than any beast of the field, which is the devil, which, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from the tree of the garden. <clears throat> and the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. You'll die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, 
She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and, and, and they knew that they were naked and ashamed now before their God. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings, trying to clothe themselves now in the presence of a God that they have been made naked and bare, and they see their guilt and their shame. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so such a beautiful creation with God and man walking together, and now the destruction that entered the world, and now they're hiding from God and trying to cover up their shame and their guilt. And they're told, when you eat of that fruit, you're going to surely die. And now they're hiding from their God. There's an angel with a sword that moves in every direction saying there's no way back into the presence of God. The sword of justice now, the soul that sins must die. And so such beauty is now destroyed. And so don't miss, to me, the greatest part of the fall. You lost God. You were created for God and you had him in a relationship and sin entered and now you've lost God, you're separated from him and everything breaks and deteriorates when you don't have God. And when you lose God, you'll, your life will fall apart. If you've come here this morning or you come every week and you've lost God, you don't evolve, you devolve and you start corrupting and decaying and everything is broken when you move away from God. We see immediately what will happen. Adam no longer walks but with God but hides. Very shortly now, Cain will kill Abel because his offering was righteous. And God says now, sin will spread to all of mankind. And God gives us an assessment then of what he sees on the earth in Genesis 6. Verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In the Hebrew, it says, before you even form a thought, it's already evil. The brokenness now of humanity is that we're our thoughts and intentions, and we're, we're just sinning continually now before our God. And it spreads, and it's, it's so defiant to God that God brings a flood. And he floods the whole earth except for Noah and his family. And then he gives a rainbow, and that rainbow is this promise that I will never flood the earth again. And the reason being is so I can now bring about this plan of redemption of bringing a new humanity into the one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. Noah then gets drunk, and sin spreads again. And as you read through Genesis, you just watch the destruction of mankind the debauchery, the sexual sin, the broken families, the deceit, the idolatry. Mankind is at odds with its maker. We're all like sheep. We can't find our way home because home is blocked. Home is cut off. There's no way back to God. And you just read Genesis and you see the brokenness of what took place that day in the garden. And now Isaiah says the whole world sits in darkness. They can't understand. They can't see. They can't figure this out. They're lost. They're ruined, they're sinful, and you don't hold the key to fix it. Nobody can find a way to fix this problem and open the door. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. That's our darkness. I look at my own life, and it affected me so deeply, this sin that took place in that garden. I was lost and ruined, and religion couldn't fix me. Morality couldn't help. I was just sitting in darkness wanting to die and couldn't find a way out. You can't use hyperbole with how much we needed mercy since the fall in the garden. Someone who would take pity on our pathetic state of being under the wrath of God and death spreading to all of us. Someone who could come and help us out of our sin and our misery. Someone who could undo the work of the devil that took place in the garden that day. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. You deserve wrath and eternal punishment. I deserve it, eternal hell. It's having compassion and working to alleviate this suffering and brokenness of humanity. 
It's, it was the only hope for the picture that is painted in Genesis and the rest of the Bible and the rest of history is the first point is we stand in need of the mercy of God. We're under his wrath rightfully and we cannot fix it and sin is spreading from our own being all the way out to the universe. We stand in need of mercy. I need someone to alleviate my suffering and my problem of being under the wrath of God. My second point, then comes the promise of mercy. Genesis 3.15, and I, the father, will put enmity between the, de the devil and the woman and between your seed and her seed, which is the rest of Genesis. These two seeds are against each other and they are this morning. And he, Jesus, shall bruise you on the head, and the devil shall bruise him on the heel. And here's the first promise here of the redemption and the salvation of the mercy of God that he will do. And from this seed of, of Adam will come one who's going to undo the works of the devil. And the cross, he's going to get his foot bruised, but he's going to crush the serpent's head and he's going to set us free from the consequences of sin and death that happened that morning in the garden. Praise be to God for the promise of this mercy. We move to Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> now the Lord said to Abram, and this is the beginning of this new people, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God is gonna start this new humanity by grace through faith, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And then we come to Genesis 15 and this promise is Sarah is barren. She has no children. Abraham is 75. He's too old now to bear children. And the promise of Genesis 3 is like a little candle flickering and about to go out. So, such a promise, there, there, there's no way for this seed to bring forth the promise of, of the one who would come and crush the serpent's head. And so how do I know, Abraham says, how do I know you're going to do this, God? And in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham and he gets those animals, you'll remember, and they cut them in half. And the way they made a covenant is the two parties would walk through those animals and say, if I don't keep my end of the covenant, may I be cut in half and destroyed. And the glory and the beauty of the gospel is that Abraham wakes up and he sees this, this flax and this, this one person walking through those animals. And it was God only. And this covenant that I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bring you out of this curse and I'm going to save you and wash you and cleanse you and bring you into my family. Um, it, God is the one who's going to do all the requirements for this to happen. Is there a greater mercy? Here's my covenant I will do everything necessary for what the covenant requires. And we will continue to see what that is. But I want you to see the mercy that it's not both of us walking through there with me committing to what I'm going to do and God committing to what he's going to do. God alone will do every requirement for you to be blessed by grace through faith. Is that not a mercy? Well, let's look to our third point then. The plan to revealing our deep need of mercy. If you'll turn to Je uh, Galatians chapter 3, just keep your Bibles open. We're going to just keep flipping from verse to verse to verse. This is going to be a beautiful morning in the Word of God. So we got mercy needed, preparation for mercy, the promise of mercy, of what God would do to bless the nations through Abraham. And now I want you to see the plan that God wants to reveal to us our deep need of mercy so we'll flee to the one who will give it. Galatians 3.15. Paul says, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it's only a man's covenant, 
Yet when it's been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. So the promise made to Abraham is by grace through faith, and then a law comes. Did, did he add conditions to us getting blessed now? And so Abraham's saying, no. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. <clears throat> he doesn't say, and to seeds, plural, as to referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. And what I'm saying is this. The law which came 430 years later from this promise to Abraham does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise that was made to Abraham. For if the inheritance is based on law, you're keeping the law and morality. It's no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So why'd you give us the law then? It was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed, Jesus, should come to whom the promise has been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? It's a great question. Do you, if you add works to a covenant, it feels like now they're contradicting. One is, I'm going to do everything. The other is, you go keep this and live. Is it contradictory? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would have indeed been based on the law. If God gave it so that you could go keep it and get right with him, then it's contradictory. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin. But the promise by faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, the law of Moses, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed when Jesus Christ came in the world. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, the one where we find all mercy. And so this law was given with a very specific purpose. He says, so that you might be justified by faith in Christ alone. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And so God gave a law so that you would look into it and you would realize, I can't keep this. It's a, it's a mirror that revealed to me my deep sin. And that I'll, there's no way to fix this problem. It runs so deep in the core of my being and in my heart. And so here's the mercy of God is, is a law that shines and says, my friend, you need mercy. You need a savior from the sin that is revealed in the law. The law will never be able to save you. It wasn't designed to be able to save you. It was a tutor that would drive you to Jesus Christ to find this mercy that we're talking about this morning. So if you're here with us um, and you don't know, understand what I'm talking about, what I want you to see is the law was given, not so you could go be a good person, but so you could realize I'm a bad person and I don't love God with my heart, mind, soul, and strength and my neighbor as myself. And now I'm under the wrath of God because the soul that sins must die and I'll never be able to perform this law and get right with God. And so what a mercy that this law tutors us to the one who can give us mercy, the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourthly, I want to then look at the history for the procurement of God's mercy. So 2,000 years after this promise was made to Abraham, it really does look like all hope is lost. 
It seems like God forgot, or maybe he's going to come up with a new plan. It had been so long. Between Malachi and Matthew, there's 400 years of silence. Our nation hasn't existed for 400 years. I mean, just think all the history of America that we know since since the um, British came over. Think how long that is. And, And it's been that long since they've heard anything from God. There's been no prophetic voice. And so here it is, it it feels silent. And then all of a sudden something breaks and and we're told in Luke, an angel named Gabriel, he comes and he appears to a virgin named Mary. And he tells her that the Holy Spirit is going to come and overshadow you, Mary, and you're going to be with a child. And he's going to be the most high God. He will be the holy one that will be in your womb. And Mary breaks out into song, and in this, listen to her song in Luke 1, 46. <clears throat> and Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Mary needed a Savior for her sin, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He's done mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He's brought down rulers from their thrones And he has exalted those who were humble. He's filled the hungry with good things. And he sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. He remembered the promise that he made to Abraham. And in mercy, he has now sent the one who would fulfill and ratify everything that the covenant demanded for us to be made right with God. And at that time, Elizabeth uh, had become pregnant as well in her old age, and Zacharias doubted, and he became mute, and he couldn't talk. And now all of a sudden, they're like, what? his name's going to be John. And, and, and they, they look at Zacharias, is it right? And he, he writes his name is John. And all of a sudden, his mouth breaks forth, and he's filled with the Spirit. And he begins to prophesy. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, John the Baptist, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high shall visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the light's gonna break in And he's going to show us the way to have peace with God. The sunrise from on high has visited us in remembrance of his mercy. What a merciful God. Jesus entered into this world to alleviate our great suffering and our separation from God. He did come to get the wrath of God off of us for sin. And that's why you cannot look at the incarnation without looking at why did he come into the world? And we saw it in our Advent today. And I was reading an article uh, last week where you got the, the Advent going on, and the Greek word for Advent is the word parousia. And parousia, whenever it's used in the New Testament, is of the second coming of Christ. 
And so the early church saw this Christ event of, of the incarnation entering into the world, dying for sins, being resurrected, accomplishing salvation, and coming back to make all things new, to consummate it. So you can never look at it without looking at the whole Christ event. So that's why we don't get stuck in a manger, but we see that he came into that manger to accomplish the whole event of salvation. His whole life in fulfilling perfect righteousness and dying for all of our transgressions and all of our sins against our God. And so Jesus has come into this world and he opened the way back into the favorable presence of God that we saw in Genesis. That beauty at creation, when we see it, he's saying, I brought it back. I've recovered it. And now we can go back and walk with God and be loved and have fellowship and know him and love him because of the mercy of our God. And how he did it was his son going up on a cross, bearing the wrath in our place coming and becoming humanity and fulfilling the law as if we fulfilled all righteousness. And so he has entered into the world to bring us back to God. That is the, the mercy of our God. And he hung on a cross in my place so that my sins could be separated as far as the east is from the west. And I'll remember him no more. The preparation for mercy was the fall and the destruction that it brought into our lives with no ability to fix it or change it or get back into his presence. The promise of mercy is that I'm going to do everything necessary to bring you back into this relationship. And the plan to reveal our deep need of mercy was this law that revealed the depth of our sin, our, our transgressions, are crossing and defying God so that we might flee to Jesus Christ to have our sins forgiven. What a gift from God. And then at the fullness of the time, the Son of God entered into this world and was incarnated into a virgin's womb, fully God and fully man, because he had to bring God and man back together. And God can't die, so he had to take on humanity so it could die. And humanity couldn't bear the wrath of God. Only God could bear the wrath of God. And he came into this world in mercy to bring us back into the presence of God. Hallelujah. Turn to Isaiah 55. Our fifth point then is the plea of mercy. And I'm praying that he'll plead with each one of our hearts this morning. This is why I picked this sermon. It's been in my heart for a while. If you'll turn with me to Isaiah 55, and we'll start in verse 1. <clears throat> Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come. Buy and eat. I love this gospel. All we bring is not gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we come empty-handed with nothing to Christ and we go away with everything. Could there be a more merciful gospel? Come with nothing. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages on what does not satisfy? Why are you spending your lives and time on that which is never going to give you this? Listen carefully to, me, carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the one we're looking at, according to the faithful mercies shown to David. Behold, I've made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Hear this, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Forsake your ways 
and your thoughts. You know what that is? That's repentance. Turn from them. Turn to this merciful God who saves and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God. Hear this, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So what, what is this? Again, this is why I chose this. My question is, what does verse 8 and 9 mean? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. And so I want to start with this principle. Go back to verse 7. And in verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts Let him return to the Lord and he'll have compassion and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. So you got in verse 7, your thoughts and your ways. And in verse 8 and 9, God's thoughts and God's ways. And so Isaiah is showing you this infinite chasm between us and God, the Holy One of Israel, the way he thinks and the way he acts and the way we think and the way we act. He's saying they're as high far as the heavens and the earth are away from each other. You need to repent and turn to God to be abundantly pardoned. The, the infinite chasm between us and God and the way we think and act is what Isaiah is after. And so you need to repent and call upon the Lord this morning. We're so broken. We, we call light darkness and darkness light. We're so broken. We reverse right and wrong, Isaiah said in chapter 5. We, we, we're so out of sync with God. We just are, there's this just infinite. We're out of sync. But what is Isaiah saying here in regards to this infinite chasm Please hear verse 7 one more time. God says, when you repent and turn back to me, I will abundantly pardon. God is calling people with wicked thoughts and wicked ways to come to him to repent. And he says to call upon him. Those who deceive and twist and pervert and do evil continually turn away from God to come and turn. And he says, and you'll find mercy. I will abundantly pardon. I heard a sermon this week where the preacher said, I'm thinking of a judge who declares you not guilty. And you walk out of the courtroom and he's never going to see you again. He just says, next case. And he, you don't really matter. You just, okay, you're, you're vindicated. Go ahead. Down the hall to the left, pay your 50 bucks. And here, he abundantly pardons. And it just brings in the heart of our God. The the joy of God is to show his mercy. You remember back in Romans 9 when, when, when Moses says, show me your glory and his glory is I'll have mercy upon whom I'll have mercy. And I'll have compassion upon whom I'll have compassion. My glory is to show mercy to whomever I desire. Turn to me. And I will abundantly pardon you. Could there be a better message this morning? The infinite chasm between you and God. Our thinking is, I got my own thoughts. Just stop. Your thoughts aren't going to get you there. There's such a chasm. Turn to God. And turn to his remedy in the Lord Jesus Christ, his son. And in him, I will abundantly Pardon all your iniquities. That's the mercy of our God to alleviate your suffering and your torment forever. There's a God who's merciful who wants to alleviate all the suffering of having your own thoughts about life and sin and what you want to do and you're just sitting here dying. Turn to God. Turn to Him. And He delights and pardon. Listen to Micah 7, 18. Great job naming your son Micah, Swiss. Who is a God like thee? Who's like our God? 
who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? Who's a God like ours that shows mercy to sinners? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love, his covenantal faithfulness. And he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham, which thou did swear to our forefathers from the days of old. What this is saying then, God is not like us. His thoughts and his ways are so beyond us. And the example that Isaiah gives is that he shows mercy and he will abundantly pardon all who turn to him in Christ. I look at mankind in my own heart. We're so quick to get angry and so slow to show mercy. We battle to forgive. We just battle it. We hold grudges, bitterness, wrongs that shape our lives. We don't show mercy to those suffering to give them what they don't deserve. And I just look at the Son of God hanging on a cross, going, Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. That's mercy. And the blind man, son of David, have mercy on me, and he heals him. The thief says, remember me today in paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. I'm thinking of David when he numbered the troops, and God says, you're going to be punished. But you can pick, David. Pick which punishment you want. And David goes, uh, I don't want to be turned over to men because they're not merciful. I'll, I'll choose the one where you punish me because you're merciful, God. And humanity isn't. His ways are not our ways. He's, he's beyond us because he's a merciful God. It's so hard for us. We have a whole Bible having to show us from every angle that God is merciful because we're so slow to get it. Our God is merciful. Turn to him this day, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will find mercy and pardon for your sin. And it is so hard to believe this because his ways are not like ours. His thoughts are not like ours. It's so hard to believe that he would show mercy to one like me. That was my battle so long early on in my faith of just how could God show mercy to someone like me. And hallelujah, man, he just kept putting the cross of Christ before me. And his ways are not like mine. I wouldn't show mercy to me. I wouldn't show mercy to you. God abundantly pardons because his ways are higher than our ways. He's not like us. Isn't that good news? Takes my breath away. But Simeon held in his arms that day. And he said, this is the instrument that God's going to use to bring about salvation, his tender mercy, as I hold this little lamb. Who is a God like ours? For God so loved the world D.A. Carson said that word for world in John, it's, it's the world and its brokenness and its fallenness and its badness that God so loved this cosmos and all of its brokenness, all of its need. This is the mercy of God as he looks out at all of us so broken. And it says that he, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the mercy of our God. That little baby lying in the manger would get the sword of justice driven through his heart that kept us away so that you could get the tender mercies of our God who can now abundantly pardon all your sins. And look back at Isaiah 55 verse 10. We'll just close with this. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word, which goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire 
and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. And so the infinite chasm between us and God in verse 9 is bridged in mercy. But still in deep reality, his thoughts and in, in ways are so different than our thoughts and ways, even in salvation. And so what he's saying is, as the rain comes down or soft snow, it falls from heaven and it touches the dry ground of earth. And so the word of God comes from heaven and it speaks to your heart. And in verse six, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he's near. And so he's drawing near this morning through this word. And so he's, he's come near in a manger. Infinitude came into this earth and he drew near. And now he's coming nearer this morning through the word of God. And he's telling you that he will abundantly pardon the one who repents and turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking mercy to our heart. The Spirit makes us hear it. He's not like us. I need this word to come to me this morning and tell me there's a God who will abundantly pardon my iniquities. And so hear his word coming down this morning. Mercy for all who will repent and turn toward our God, who will believe in the one that God sent into this world to rescue us from our sin and our condemnation and our separation from God. Let it fall on your heart like soft snow on the grass this morning. Salvation belongs to our God. Amen? What is it doing in your heart this morning? Do you hear it? I want to close out with my last point, then the pattern of mercy. Jesus stood on the Sermon on the Mount and said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. When you receive the mercy of God and he abundantly pardons, it makes you a merciful person. And our generation is just getting so mean and nasty and judgmental that these kind of people are going to shine like diamonds on a black velvet. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive the mercy of God. As I look back on my life, on the days that God has given to me, just how many times I'm quicker to run to judgment than to mercy. I just want you to ask yourself, are you merciful? Are you merciful? Before the one that was born into this world and died on a cross and rose and is coming again to judge the living and the dead, are you merciful? Because it shows if you're drinking up this mercy of God that we have found in Christ Jesus. The way I treat my wife, my kids, my friends, my enemies. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I can't get over the mercy that God has shown me in this Christ and continues to show me daily. To God be the glory for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for giving us Jesus Christ. I thank you that you so loved this fallen world. What mercy to look upon us groveling in darkness and can't find the key. And the sunrise from on high visited us and the beams of light have broken in. And now we see the glory of God in the face of Christ. We see the great tender mercy of our God. And we turn from our ways and our thoughts we turn to a God who will abundantly pardon. Your ways are so beyond ours and your thoughts. We turn to Jesus and we glory in the Christ. We glory in Christ alone for the one that you can abundantly pardon us through. God, I pray, pray that it will make everyone in this room truly merciful. God, we miss the boat in this in so many ways. Let mercy flow like a river in this church, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.